Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Orr, and uh, this is Aaron. We are colleagues at Databricks, and we're both Spark committers, and today we're going to talk about this new feature in Spark 1.2 called dynamic allocation. So what that means specifically, I'm going to elaborate shortly. But first, uh, maybe I should get in stage. Maybe not. OK. <laughs> so first, I'm going to give a quick overview of why people love Spark. Oh, actually, how many of you in the audience has used Spark before? All right, how many of you guys are using it in production? Wow, that's a lot of people, including Aaron. OK. So yeah, first I'm going to describe some of the advantages of Spark that makes you know, Spark so popular. So the, perhaps the most commonly cited one is um, in-memory computation. So what this means more specifically is that you can share any state that your application uh, builds up over time in your application across jobs. And not only can you, can you share um, like metadata state across applications, you can also cache the data itself. And like everyone here probably knows that already. And so this is especially good for iterative workloads like machine learning. So the second really important advantage is that uh, scheduling is efficient compared to other, other uh, similar systems. And this is because we partition the data into many, many small chunks. And then we, um, and then we spread, spread the task out um, across the, the nodes in the cluster pretty evenly. So this helps a lot with uh, taking advantage of data locality. And this is pretty good for um, streaming, especially because every task is now, you know, it, it's very short-lived and, and you know, it's like very evenly spread out. And the last point probably throw, uh, flows in pretty nicely from the second one is that recovery is also very fine-grained because we split the task into, sorry, we split the job into many partitions. And so if the whole thing fails at some point, then we only, most of the time, we only need to rerun like a few of the tasks instead of the whole job. And this is good for like any large scale computation. All right, so over time, because of these advantages, the use cases of Spark have uh, sort of exploded. And we're, we're starting to see these new use cases that are not as common before. So the first one is a long running ETL pipeline. So an example of this would be you have a bunch of tweets and you want to load them in as JSON into parquet files and maybe like run SQL queries on them later. The other thing is that we're starting to see job servers. Uh, for the most prominent example is probably like Uyala job server. So this is a long running Spark context that people submit their, uh, their Spark jobs remotely. Our interactive shell, well, that one's been around for a while, but I put it in there because uh, Cloudera is working on this thing called Hive on Spark, which you know, pre presents a REPL interface. Yeah, so here are some examples. And people are also starting to use streaming. So just a few years ago, streaming is like not a big deal at all. Like barely anyone uses Spark, Spark streaming, but now uh, you know, a lot more people are using it in production, and that's all very exciting. And this is relevant here because streaming actually often has a pretty dynamic workload. Uh, for instance, your data, so oops, your data source might be from, well, again, tweets in which, uh, for example, you might want to find uh, all the tweets within a region like for a, long, for a long duration. In which case, when people go to sleep, there's probably less input data coming in. When people wake up, there's probably more. So therefore, um, people need to start worrying about dyna dynamic workload. <coughs> All right. All right. So these three use cases, um, Spark definitely you know works with them, but it's not like the, the current Spark before 1.2 is not completely ideal when it when it comes to these new use cases. So yeah, so now Aaron and I are going to do a quick demo of the first use case, which is the ETL pipeline. <coughs> uh, fortunately, there's not a better way. Okay, is this safe to sit on? <laughs> Actually. 
Can you guys hear me? Should, should I use the mic or no? Okay, all right. Yeah, because I need both hands for this. I'm just going to talk louder. All right, so I'm going to run two Spark applications. All right. They're both going to be, oops. They're both going to be Spark shells. Oops. Yeah. And each of them are going to request 13 executors to begin with. Oops. OK. So Oh. <laughs> so you'll notice that I'm running on Yarn. Um, and so this cluster actually, it doesn't, well, any cluster has like a, a fixed capacity of resources that I can allocate. And since both of them ask for as many as 13 executors, you know, uh, not both of them are going to get it because these executors have two gigs each and they're pretty beefy. Oops, that's the wrong one. Sorry. All right. So this, uh, oh, by the way, this is an opportunity to showcase the, uh, the most recent job UI, which is only in 1.2. So instead of, uh, instead of showing a, a list of stages where without like clearly defining the boundaries of the stages, you, know, you, you now have a job overview. So that, that's very nice. So, the top application is the one that I started first, and therefore it has 13 executors, right? It requires a lot of them. And the bottom application, I started this one later, so it only has one executor. And uh, you, you can see that since both of these are submitted to the same cluster, they share resources, and the one that's submitted later uh, gets fewer because you know, that's how the scheduling policy works. All right, so what the top one is going to do is that it's going to run uh, a little Scala program. So what this does is that it's going to run a, a simple ETL. Uh, you don't have to worry about the details, but basically we're loading uh, JSON data from, from Twitter. And then periodically, it's going to check whether there's new data. And if there is, it's going to uh, read it from HDFS, uh, do, do some like filtering on it, and write it back to HDFS. So let me just run this. In this top one. All right. And because we don't actually want to keep creating data, uh, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to create a, a small file to like, simulate the creation of data. And uh, Aaron's going to do that for us. OK? So now what this is doing is that it's loading the, the data from HDFS and you know, doing some computation on it, doing some ETL stuff on it. So now what the bottom one is going to do uh, is going to do a, a variant of word count. So oops, I didn't copy the whole thing. OK. So what this does, essentially, um, instead of the normal word count, it counts the most popular, uh, 10 most popular bigrams. So you know, like any two words that are, that are like right next to each other. OK, so now that, now that the, the first loading is done, um, the bottom application is going to start doing the word count. And remember, it only has one executor. So it's not actually going, going to uh, run that quickly. Although right now it looks like it's running pretty fast, but it could be much faster. Um, so meanwhile, you notice that the top application, even though it has 13 executors, is not actually doing anything because it's waiting for input data to come in. So wouldn't it be really nice if the top application can just release some resources in the cluster and, uh, al and allocate them to the bottom application instead? So that would definitely speed this up. Yeah, so the bottom application, by the way, it's uh, broken down to three stages. So first, it needs to do a repartition. And then it needs to, it needs to you know, do the reduce and the normal word count. And then it's going to sort it. So it's going to do three shuffles. And it's taking a while. You know. Meanwhile, the, the top application is just not really doing anything useful. All right, so it looks like that finished. And it took, 
about a minute. Right? Uh, can you guys, actually, can you guys see this clearly? Yeah? People at the back, can you see it? Yeah, OK, good. Yeah, so this took about 60 seconds uh, with only one executor. So that's, we could probably do better. OK, so now let's, whoops, OK. Now let's <coughs> look at this from a higher level angle. All right, maybe I should just, yeah. OK, I'm actually going to stand up here so I can see the slides myself as well. Uh, hello? Oh, wow. OK. Sorry. Oh, and I also need. Okay. All right, so as a quick refresher, I'm going to give a quick overview of what, what, a typical, what the typical Spark architecture looks like. Um, so here's your cluster. Oh, oh, this thing is weird. It shouldn't be showing. Ah. Does anyone know how I can hide this? <laughs> Play. No? Huh? Oh, OK. Just like that. Well, anyway, OK, you guys can ignore the bottom thing. But here's your typical Spark cluster. Uh, this one has three nodes. And it, every Spark cluster has this thing called the cluster manager. And this is a thing that, that gives out resources to the application. And, uh, in our particular example earlier, this was the one that gave out 13 executors to the first application and one executor, one executor to the second application. So every cluster has a, uh, has a set of resources. And this is typically in terms of cores and memory. So now, let's say an application comes in. Uh, a driver is the, the thing that contains a Spark context, which is what defines an application. So it might look something like this. This is, a, this is your typical word count. It's like much simpler than the one that we just did. And yeah, so here's your application. What it's going to do is it's going to request executors from the cluster manager. It's going to say, these are my resource requirements. And the cluster manager is going to grant executors to that application. So after these executors are started, um, you know, we've started using some of the, the existing resources in the cluster. So, Let's say another application comes in. This time it's a Spark shell. And it looks something like this, as you have seen. Um, and this one is a long running Spark shell. So you can imagine this one might do some ETL thing that we've been doing earlier. So this one g comes in and does the same thing. It asks for resources and it gets resources. But it gets like a lot more resources than the previous one. Right? So notice that the resources aren't actually given up until after the application is finished. So here, the orange application, my Spark app, you know, like it's a short running one, so it finishes. Meanwhile, Spark Shell is a long running one, and it holds on to all the cluster resources for a long time. So I like to highlight this example as, as a current limitation in Spark, before 1.2, that is. Um, so let's say another application comes in right now. Uh, this, this time it says, uh, Python application. It tries to acquire as many resources as the other app, or it tries to acquire as many resources as, say, Spark Shell, but it can't because there just aren't that many executors for the cluster manager to give out. And therefore, if the Spark Shell becomes idle, as we have seen, for example, in the ETL job, uh, it continues to hold on to all the cluster resources. And this is pretty wasteful. So let's take a look at this problem in a different angle. So this is a, a graph of the resource usage of a particular application. Um, so this one is a, is a periodic job. So let's say every 30 minutes it runs a job, and that accounts for each of those spikes. However, the allocation is actually static. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's dig deeper into the, into the graph. So, Every time a new job comes in, you use more resources. And you, you use more of the resources that you're allocated. And additionally, uh, when it goes down, it doesn't go down all the way. Well, very frequently, it doesn't go down all the way because there are these, there are these things called stragglers. And what these are are, are essentially tasks that, are, that take much longer to run than other tasks. And so while these stragglers are running, the tasks that have finished much, much earlier, uh, they're now they're now just you know, 
that they're not running at all, and the executors that, are, that were running them are now idle and not doing really any useful work. So the bottom line is that more resources are allocated than is used. So, oh yeah, more specifically, it's this particular area right here. All of these could have been freed up when you know, we just hold on to all of it currently. So what we want is more like something like the following. We want dynamic resource allocation, meaning when a job finishes, we want to give up the resources that we, we held on to earlier. And this leads to more efficient utilization of the resources in the cluster. So hopefully by now, like, I've hammered it hard enough in your head that you, you know exactly what the problem is. So here's a formalized um, you know, statement of the problem. So Spark doesn't currently utilize cluster resources super efficiently. And this is largely because every application assumes that the, the set of resources that it gets from the very beginning are you know, static, statically allocated. So why is this a Spark problem? Like, um, like how, how do other systems deal with this? Uh, any like MapReduce Hadoop users out there? Okay, how many of you used to use MapReduce before you used Switch to Spark? Great. So, do you guys have any insights on whether this is a problem for MapReduce or not? Well, there's a little bit of mappers allowed by the job tracker, and so as the mappers, or instead of mappers, you finish, you know, that path of resources to release. Right. Yeah, so essentially the execution model in MapReduce is a little different than that. As soon as a container finishes, it just, you know, it just finishes. Like, you no longer hold on to all the resources. And that's because, uh, and that's because, in Spark, every executor is considered to be long running, so it runs many, many uh, small tasks over the course of the application. Whereas in in Hadoop MapReduce, for example, executor is short lived and expected only to, you know, run very, very few tasks. But these are much larger tasks. So that, um, a clear advantage of of uh, running many small tasks with a long running executors as I mentioned earlier, is that you can take advantage of data locality much more easily. And also, fault tolerance is uh, much more fine-grained. And so you can recover at much finer granularity. Yeah, so the solution, then, is some sort of dynamic allocation, meaning every application will scale the number of executors it uses up and down based on the workload. So what this means on a high level term, like super high level, is that when executors are idle, well, we kill them. When we need more executors, we ask for more. It's as simple as that. All right, what could go wrong? Um, so here you have a simple shuffle. So by the way, in Spark, uh, how a shuffle works is that it's pool-based, meaning in the map stage, the re uh, every executors write shuffle files to disk locally, and then in the reduce stage, the same group of executors pull the shuffle files remotely from, uh, yeah, from other nodes. And so what happens if we kill one of these executors? Well, the shuffle files that, that are written by them, you know, we can no longer, no longer access them. Because while they're alive, these executors also serve as the, uh, the, the server for these shuffle files that the other executors talk to. And so when the, during the reduce phase, when the other executors try to fetch these shuffle files, you know, they can't find all of them and they have to recompute some of them. So meaning, if we don't consider shuffle at all, if, if we don't consider this problem at all, then uh, if we do dynamic allocation nevertheless, then we'll never make progress for this kind of workload. And I think like shuffle is a pretty common workload, so obviously we can't neglect that. So this is not the complete story. And so really, we need to, you know, we need to ensure that Spark continues to serve the shuffle files after killing the executors. So we need to start all over. Um, and so Aaron's going to introduce the external shuffle service that solves this problem.
All right, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not as cool as Andrew, so I can't stand as high as him. So hopefully you can see me down here. Um, so as, as Andrew said, I'm going to be talking about the external shuffle service. So the problem, of course, that we're trying to solve is that we fetch shuffle files from executors. And if the executor goes down, we can't fetch them anymore. So, but this is a fundamental problem, because we wrote these files to disk. And so even though the executor process went down, that doesn't mean that the files are not there anymore. There's just no one to give us those files. All right. So what we're going to introduce is this thing called an external shuffle service. And so what is this? Well, it just means that we need a long-lived standalone server. And this process needs to be more long-lived than a single executor. It could even be more long-lived than any given Spark context. Um, it could even outlive a certain Spark version. Uh, so we would like to be able to do this, um, ha have the service live potentially inside even another JVM to make it easier to deploy. This is not a requirement per se, but it would be nice. Uh, to say, for instance, into the Yarn node manager, which already lives on every node, uh, or into the standalone worker, which also already lives into each node. Also, this, this shuffle service needs to have the same transport level API as the existing shuffle. Like an executor, it should be transparent whether you're reading from another executor or you're reading from the shuffle service. It should just be an IP and a port, and you just ask it for, for shuffle files. And, and finally, uh, you know, obviously a very important thing in Spark is performance. And so you know, two like, nice features we'd like to have are zero copy I.O., meaning you copy directly from a file to the, the I.O. Uh, channel over the network and off-heap buffer reuse. So when I, when I get data incoming from, from the network, I, I reuse buffers which live off-heap, um, meaning I don't allocate off-heap buffers, and I don't allocate on-heap buffers, so there's no garbage collection. All right. So to give some history, so what we like, you know, we, we like all these requirements. So what existed in Spark before? So in 1.1, the way, the way of transferring data between executors, uh, this is cache data as well as shuffle data, is something called the connection manager which is a great name because it manages connections. So unfortunately, over time, we sort of kept putting stuff into the middle of this. And it was sort of, it became almost a black box. It was, it was very tangled and a little bit hard to understand. And this meant that it was relatively hard to extract it out into a single service. Fortunately, around the same time, uh, Reynolds Shin uh, was doing his work on Petabyte Shuffle, which you may have heard of. He was trying to test Spark to its limits to see how does it handle when you really have a huge amount of data and no, like definitely not enough memory, for instance. Um, and so he was doing a petabyte of, of shuffle, a petabyte of sorting, and he noticed that a lot of the time uh, was being spent in garbage collecting inside the connection manager because it continuously creates these small objects when you do huge shuffles. And so this became a problem. And so he wrote a pretty quick prototype of a netty transfer service to kind of replace the connection manager. And he sort of cleaned it up and submitted it as a PR. And, and we took this sort of as, as a, uh, an opportunity to actually refactor the service into its own you know, uh, uh, module so that we could reuse it for both in the Spark shuffle and the Spark uh, uh, cache block transfers, as well as an external type of shuffle service. Okay. So this gave, gave rise to the network uh, module within Spark, which is extracted out from Spark core. It's still in Spark, but extracted out from Spark core. Um, we wanted some of the goals here were to have minimal dependencies. We wanted, as I said, to be able to put it even within other people's JVMs, which means that we can't be having a lot of baggage or a lot of requirements. And to this end, because we decided on having minimal dependencies, we ended up writing it in Java. Uh, so we don't have the Scala runtime libraries and we don't depend on a specific version of Scala, for instance. And so indeed, here is the totality of the dependencies of the, sh the common module. T generally, Maven, file, Maven palms are very large, so this is a you know, very small one. So we, we depend on Netty, we depend on SLF for JAPI, and Guava. And even Guava has given us some problems, but uh, it's kind of necessary for clean, clean Java code, in my opinion. So f fundamentally, what did we end up with? So this, this is actually how it looks in the source tree, but I think it also gives a good sense for what the components look like at a high level. So we have this component called network common, which is just transport level network like transfer bytes from here to, to here to there. It gives a control plane, it gives a data plane, and it totally doesn't mention the word Spark. Well, it probably mentions the word Spark, but it doesn't use, uh, have any Spark terminology within it. On top of, directly on top of that, of, of this Nandy type server, we built, we rebuilt, we refactored the uh, shuffle and cache block server within Spark. So this is what executors use to transfer cache data and shuffle data. And note that this couldn't be exactly the same thing as the external shuffle server, because it also includes these cache files. 
Uh, and and if, uh, mem if files are cached in memory, uh, rather, if blocks are cached, blocks of an RDD are cached in memory, then clearly no external service can serve those without having some connection between them. So it was still necessary to have some component that, was, that still resides within the executor for transferring cache blocks. On the other side, though, and reusing all the same code, we have this shuffle server, which just is a standalone application, which can simply read shuffle files from disk and transfer them over the network. So you're saying, I want block zero. OK, I find it. I, I seek into the file, and I return that block. And on top of that, we have just these two little pieces which just instantiate the server. So core deploy is sort of the standalone worker and Mesos, and network yarn is the yarn, yarn side. All right, so the, both of those top parts are very small. Okay. And so just to give an example of what does a shuffle look like and how does it look like in particular with a shuffle service. So this is, on the left, there's an XTOM executor and it wants some data. Remember that this is a pull-based model. So there's some files somewhere else on some other machine and it wants to pull them. And so as far as the executor on the left is concerned, it may be pulling from a, another a shuffle service, which is either inside of an executor or external to the executor but on the same machine. And so first he's like, give me three blocks three blocks from the shuffle. And we sort of coalesce multiple, multiple block fetches within one request, just because each individual block may be small, so we want to sort of group them together to maximize throughput. So he says, give me blocks with ID 3, 7, and 16. And he says, OK, I've, I've opened those three blocks. They're ready for transport, and I've, detect I've made sure they're all present. And so you just use the ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, to fetch these three chunks. And so then, in parallel, the executor can send out uh, three uh, concurrent fetch requests for each of the three blocks, zero indexed, and then he eventually gets the fetch re fetches are back. Um, well, hopefully not too eventually, pretty fast. Um, and this is, of course, so the, the data is coming in through this sort of zero copy I.O. on the sender side, and the receiver side is going into these buffers, which are allocated off heap. Okay, so that's a very sort of quick overview of, of how the shuffle works. But what we get here is now that I can kill the executors, and I still have this external shuffle service, which the executors can still talk to and fetch the data. All right. So now we can safely kill executor. We've solved one problem of dynamic scaling. And so I'll hand it back to Andrew to describe the rest of dynamic scaling now that all of our problems are solved. Sorry, give me a second. <clears throat> Hello? Oh, I forgot the mic. Hello? Hello? Okay. Hello? Hello? All right, cool, thanks. <laughs> OK, so now that we can safely kill executors, let's go back to complete our story. Um, earlier, I gave you a very, very, very high level overview of what it means to do dynamic allocation. And um, revisiting, revisiting that again, this is uh, basically when executors are idle, we kill them. When we need more executors, request them. So this is really easy to understand, but what are the details? So to, answer the, to, to, uh, to understand the details, we need to answer three questions. right? Uh, when do we request executors? When do we kill them? Well, when do we kill them? When they're idle. Um, how many executors to add every time? And how many to remove? Uh, which executors do we want to kill? All right, so let's talk about requesting first. So the, the condition for re requesting executors is simply that um, we request executors when there are pending tasks. So what pending tasks mean here exactly is that um, these are tasks that are waiting to be scheduled. And they cannot be scheduled because the existing set of executors are already running other tasks. And so this condition, this condition necessarily implies that we need more executors for the application to make, further, uh, to, to, make, uh, to, to make more efficient use of the cluster resources. So the way this works in detail is that when this is satisfied, we request them in rounds. And the number added every round increases exponentially from the previous round, meaning the first round we add one, and two, and four, and so on. And every round is like, I don't know, every 10 seconds or something. This is configurable. Additionally, this must also be bounded by some upper limit, because as you all know, exponential increase goes up pretty fast, and you, know, like, you need some kind of cap. 
Otherwise, you might, I don't know. OK, anyway. Um, also, we're not going to request more executors than is actually needed to saturate all the pending tasks. Because it doesn't make sense to you know, ask more than what you actually need. So let's look at a quick example of how this actually works. So here's a graph of the number of executors. That's the y-axis. And uh, you have time on the x. So uh, from time 0 to 3, you have a uh, queue of pending tasks that are waiting to be scheduled. And therefore, we're adding executors. <coughs> and uh, same with from time uh, 5 to 10. Yeah, We need more executors, in, and so we're adding them exponentially. And you can already see the shape of it. So for time uh, 3 to 5, there are no pending tasks. So, you can, so we don't need more executors. You know, so the existing set is good enough. Notice that uh, the exponential curve kind of stops at 9. Um, so if it had continued, it would have gone up to like 27. But this is because we capped the number of executors at 24, and therefore it doesn't go up all the way. You know, normally, it would have kept increasing much quicker. So this is important, because if we grab all the resources in the cluster too quickly, then all the other applications will be starved. And so we're back to the same problem as we had before. So we have to have to cap it. Um, the next question is, why do, we, why do we choose an exponential increase model? So much of this has a lot to do with uh, the same reasons why TCP, for example, uses slow start from the beginning. When you only, it turns out that you only need like one or two extra executors. You don't want to ramp up immediately all the way to like, you know, as much resources as you can grab, because you, you might have to like throw, throw, throw away the rest of them uh, shortly afterwards. So why can't we just do a slow linear increase? Well, that's pretty cautious. Like in the beginning, if you get two executors, you, like, that, that's pretty safe. Well, what if you need a lot of executors? That's the other, other extreme. Uh, if you have a linear growth, then you're going to ramp it really, really slowly. And you might not actually end up at the number of resources that you actually need. So that's a requesting story. The removing story is actually much simpler. Um, we simply remove executors when they're idle. And what I mean by idle, in particular, is uh, when it's no longer running any task. <coughs> and the condition is triggered when an executor has been idled for, for some uh, configurable duration. Notice that this condition is mutually exclusive in, in most circumstances with the add condition. When you have idle executors, then, then uh, the number of pending tasks can't be you know, greater than zero, because otherwise the executors won't be idle, like they'd be running those tasks. Um, this may not be true for, for uh, jobs with preferred locations, but this is true for most circumstances. So given that, it makes sense to have this as the remove condition, condition and have the other one uh, when they're pending tasks as the request condition. OK, so let's go back to our original three questions that we set out to answer. Um, so when do we request and remove exec executors? Well, when we have pending tasks and when they're idle. And uh, the number of executors we request is it, it increases expon exponentially in round. And the executors that we remove are the ones that are idle. All right, so here it seems that we have the complete story. Right? The other question that we were going to answer earlier was that what happened to the shuffle files? Well, the answer is very simple. Use Aaron's external shuffle service. And, there, and therefore, all the shuffle files that you write will stay there even after the executors are, are dead. Uh, in Yarn, for, uh, for instance, uh, Spark has this thing called the Yarn Shuffle Service, which runs in each one of the node managers. Uh, how many of you are familiar with like Yarn terminology? Yeah. OK, not that many. But it, so as the name suggests, the node manager runs on every single node. And therefore, it makes sense to you know, run the shuffle service in it. And the shuffle service, by the way, is a long-running application. Well, Aaron already talked about this. But it, basically, it's independent of the executor. So even after we kill them, uh, we continue to serve shuffle files because of, these, be, because of this service. And this lives in the uh, network yarn module that, I don't know if you remember the component graph, but it was like somewhere over here. Yeah. Uh, this is similar in spirit to what MapReduce does. So MapReduce also has to deal with this problem. Um, which is that after the containers die, you still need to serve 
files written by those containers. And in MapReduce, uh, this uses a shuffle handler. All right, so how do we use this? Well, it's actually fairly straightforward. There are only three uh, required parameters that you need to set. Well, first of all, obviously, you need to enable it. And then you need to set the lower and upper bounds. Uh, and additionally, you have three optional parameters that control how quickly you remove executors and, and uh, how quickly you add them. I'm not going to gonna, gonna go into the details here, but, but yeah, uh, yeah, I'll show them again later during the final demo. <coughs> additionally, you also need to set up the shuffle service for Yarn, for example. Um, you follow these steps. Uh, they're kind of detailed, so I'm not going to I'm not going to dig into them. But basically, you need to start the node managers with the uh, Yarn shuffle service that I talked about previously. So, aside from all of this, like automatic dynamic. Uh, allocation that detects whether you have tasks that are pending to be scheduled and whether executors are idle, you can also do this manually as a Spark 1.2. So if you, if you have uh, other, other policies that you might want to use with dynamic allocation, you can call sc.requestExecutors or sc.killExecutors with the given executor IDs in your own application to, <coughs> to uh, specify your own policies. So for instance, um, you might not want to remove any executors with like, cache blocks or you, you might want to request executors on certain nodes, certain nodes with like data on them. All right. So we've seen how we, we've seen how dynamic allocation solves a problem that was basically starving some applications with resources uh, from from getting the resources they need earlier. So now let's run the exact same application, well, exact same two applications that we ran earlier, to see how this works. Oh, first of all, let me show you very quickly. Uh, can, can you guys hear me again? All right, good. All right. Got to type with two hands, so. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I'm just going to show you uh, one application. <coughs> oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, I need to kill the other guy. All right. Can you guys see this? All right, so here's my Spark uh, config default. <coughs> so this is where I set the parameters that I previously talked about. We're using yarn here, and every executor has two gigs. <coughs> uh, now I'm going to enable dynamic allocation, and I'm going to uh, scale up to yeah. Let's give it 13. All right. So now let's talk about the two, the three param parameters that I said were optional. So executor idle timeout, as the name suggests, is how long the executor has to be idle for before you remove them. So here I have 10 seconds. Uh, the default is like 600 seconds, so it's fairly a long time. Uh, and uh, here are the corresponding, the bottom one, are the corresponding configs for adding executors. So you start adding them as soon as uh, there, there have been pending tasks for three seconds. That's what the first one says. And the second one, let me make this eight, <coughs> is that uh, every eight seconds thereafter, if there are still pending tasks, then you keep adding more executors, like two and four and eight and so on. Exponential increase. All right, so now that I've set all these parameters, let me show you in action how this works. Uh, I'm also going to use timers to show you that it's actually you know, time dependent, not just like randomly, you, know, you, you lose your executors. OK, so oh, let's show you the UI. OK. All right, so you know, here I have like all 13 of my executors. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, sorry, I'm like jumping around. Uh, I'm going to run a simple, simple job, paralyze. So it's a very, very small RDD. Okay, I'm just going to call it very small RDD. So it has 10 integers. And additionally, oh, I guess we have 13, right? So yeah, 
it has 13 integers and it also has 13 partitions, meaning one partition has exactly one integer. So that's like super small. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this into two batches. So the first batch, if i less than or equal to 6, the first batch is going to sleep for 15 seconds. Uh, so, or in other words, you can think of this as the first batch is going to be busy for 15 seconds. It's going to be constantly running a task. Uh, while the second task is going to finish right away. All right. So let me pull up the timers. So what these timers are is when, so, so when uh, the timer hits zero, that's when the executors are supposed to be removed. So let's see this in action. So I'm going to start, oops, oh, I already, I already screwed this up. I'm going to start this as at 20 to remedy it. <laughs> All right, so I started the first timer immediately because, you know, uh, seven executors finished their tasks immediately, so they have been idle for it. Uh, oh, oh, shoot, I forgot to start the other timer. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, if I refresh now, I'm, I only get six, exe six executors. Notice that I don't lose all of them right away because some of them were still, well, they were still sleeping, but they were basically doing some some work, so they weren't like completely idle yet. All right. So now that those are also idle, you know, I'm done with one executor. So previously I had 13, and now I have one, and therefore, and, and that's because not all executors are constantly running uh, at all times. All right. So I've shown you scaling down. Let's show you scaling up. So I'm going to run a slightly larger uh, job. So it's also very simple, but it's just like larger. OK, so it, no, this one has like 50 million integers. And, and I'm just going to do a simple, yeah, simple reduce by key. OK. It's not like super meaningful, but you know, that's what it is. Oops. OK, so now it's running. And you can see that it's progressing very slowly in the beginning because we only have one executor. So it, it's barely making any progress. And over time, you'll realize that we're starting to get more and more executors because they're pending tasks. And so now we have a larger set of executors to run these tasks. Uh, oh, I don't know why it's, huh. Something is weird. Huh? Well, it's supposed to scale all the way up, but like, you get the idea, right? <laughs> yeah, I might be running another application that like holds onto all these resources somewhere. All right, well, that's really unfortunate, but um, OK. Assuming that it worked. So you've seen how it scales up, right? Uh, now I'm going, to run, I'm going to run the exact same thing that I ran earlier uh, in the beginning of this talk. And that would be the ETL pipeline and the funky word count that we did. So just give me a second. I accidentally killed the other terminal. OK. Let me just verify that the configs were set properly. Yeah, weird. They seem to be correct. All right, anyway. Uh, OK, so now what I'm going to do is you know, do the same thing that I showed you earlier. So the top one is still going to do an ETL, okay? Uh, but the bottom one is going to. Whoops. Bottom one is going to do the funky word count. All right. So as before, the top application is the one that I started first. So it has more executors. It has 
it starts with 12, and the bottom one, sorry, has to have to jump back and forth, and the bottom one only has one to begin with. Okay, so we're all set up. So now I'm going to start the ETL pipeline. All right, so Aaron, would you like to start? All right, so what Aaron did was he, he triggered the uh, the input data, so you know, now we're we're loading that data. So this is going to take some time, uh, and it's using all twelve executors. Oh yeah, in the meantime, I should start setting up the other one. Whoops, sorry. Okay. Okay, so now that the loading is done, I'm going to run the work. So notice that the top application, after it has finished, after it has finished the uh, the loading, it released the executors that it previously held onto. And so you you would also quickly notice that the bottom application now has, you know, a lot of executors because it acquired it from the cluster that. Uh, that, that now feed them up. And yeah, I, I have like more executors coming in. So now I'm going to do the word count sort again. And this time it has 12 executors instead of one. So it's you know, making much quicker progress. And what I want to compare is the, the total time it takes for it to finish running this job. <coughs> so this is probably the last stage. All right, so this one only took 23 seconds. What was the other one? 60? OK, yeah. So it's like you know, at, at least twice as fast. So yeah, this is a, uh, oh, and, and like the executors are now removed because it's been 10 seconds. Like I've been talking way too long. All right, so yeah, this is dynamic allocation in Spark 1.2. And uh, hope you, you know, get to try it out today. Yeah. Uh, also, in, in summary, so uh, dynamic allocation, you know, lets your application use uh, cluster resources more efficiently, and external shuffle service makes this possible uh, because now we don't lose shuffle files across executors when we kill them. So yeah, try it out today. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you, are you guys familiar with Tachyon? So you can talk about how that works. Yeah, Aaron, do you want to come on stage and talk about it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think this works, but maybe not for the webcast. This, I think this one also works. Oh, really? It's been a long time. Okay. Although for the webcast, I might do that. Yeah. Uh, let's do that. Uh, let's do all the Okay. So, um, do you have, a, so could you specify maybe a little more uh, the question? Yeah, so Tachyon uh, solved a similar problem. So, so for, ex for example, one thing this does not solve is if I down an executor, then I still lose its cache memory. Right? As I said, that, that's cached in, inside the executor JVM, and so it doesn't matter if, you know, like there's no way to, to, to keep that alive. So if you use Tachyon sort of as a, as a cluster memory system, then you can actually store it in Tachyon so it remains in memory, although serialized, and then you could, you could continue to use it even after you, you uh, take down the executors. So I think it's, it's kind of complementary. There's a separate question of, of why Spark, Spark could use Tachyon uh, as the intermediate shuffle source. Um, and we chose not to do this be partially because we didn't want to have a hard dependency on Tachyon in, in every cluster manager, but also because um, we think that this, this actual shuffle service is actually small enough that it could theoretically fit, or, or at least Tachyon could implement the same API. And so that we, we do actually want to integrate with Tachyon. So you don't have to run a separate shuffle service uh, if you want to just run Tachyon by itself. So I, I think in the long term, we want to basically merge the two. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's still being voted right now. It's not officially released yet. Oh, thank you. It's not officially released yet, but um, you can, if you, if you go to GitHub and check out Spark, you can check out the, uh, the v1.2 you know, RC2 tag. So that's the latest RC, and um, yeah, you, you can try it out today based on that. You're going to have to build it yourself, though. As a release candidate, it's, it's, you know, it's very close to actual release. It's really not, not like running on master, so it actually should be stable. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, it, it's kind of implied by this presentation, I guess, because we only talked about Yarn. So currently, for 1.2, yes, it only works on Yarn. Um, so for standalone mode and for MISOs, which are the other cluster managers that Spark runs on, uh, we'll soon support it in, say, like 1.3. And the reason why why Yarn came first was because Yarn is like meant to be a multi-tenant environment not just like for Spark, but like for uh, other applications that have traditionally run on it. So therefore, it, it makes sense to for Spark to also, um, you know, uh, adopt that kind of utilization. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's not directly related to this elastic scaling, but uh, I remember, you know, reading of the news, uh, news group that uh, you guys are going to Yeah, we, we were gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, okay. Uh, that's exciting. Yeah, that, that's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's currently not. There's currently not a solution for that yet. We haven't had enough engineering time. So I can I can talk briefly. So there there is a. Uh, I don't actually, we have, I'm not sure if we've solidified it on the roadmap. I can't speak for that, I'm sorry. But uh, we, there is already like a PR app that does something similar. And I think uh, in my head, I want to take that sort of thing and general, it's, it's for join, by the way. The PR that's currently out is just for join. I want to generalize that to use it for like co group, group by key as well. Uh, so I, I can't promise anything for 1.3, but uh, there are definitely uh, tentative plans to, to resolve it. And we know the importance of it. So we're, we're hope, really hoping. Well, so yeah, uh, group by key is, isn't the end all. I usually you can rewrite things using reduce by key or another, you know, other types of uh, aggregation. Yeah. Also, if you have to use group by key, you can consider somewhat hacky approach of like splitting the key into smaller keys, and you know, in which case you have fewer values for one key. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean when you say the application has to specify a number of... Yeah. Uh, so, fr from the user of this feature's perspective, um, this is intended to be all like abstracted away from you. So you shouldn't have to worry about this at all. Um, the two bounds that you provide, which the lower bound and the upper bound, are are only meant to be well meant to be lower and upper bounds. They're not meant to be like say like uh, it's, it's not like you're, on average you're going to use like somewhere. In, you're not going to use like exactly in between, for example. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'll let you point. Yeah. So uh, I guess there's actually two questions there. Um, one is related to uh, how streaming works with this in general. And there's actually a problem for streaming, uh, which is that streaming actually 
for many use cases, will have a long-running receiver task, which actually constantly receives data, and it's actually never, doesn't make the executor idle. So in, for that use case, actually, this job as it, as it stands in 1.2 isn't sufficient. And so we do want to integrate with stream better, so that's not true. The second question is, if executors are coming, if, if tasks are coming in relatively commonly, uh, will they be scheduled onto the, uh, the exact same machine? And I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm not, it would be it's sort of like, I don't think it's defined by the spec if they would be. It may happen to be the case, but I, I don't actually know the case for that. I think streaming, though, streaming is the, the common case in which that would happen, and for that we already sort of don't have a complete answer yet. So, yeah, if you're interested in using this with uh, the, uh, using this with streaming, you should probably talk to TD. Um, it really depends on you know what what's on his plate because he's like the one man team basically on streaming. Well, the, we're getting more executor. Sorry, we. <laughs> <laughs> there are pending tasks, so we are requesting more engineers. We're we're, we're getting more engineers on streaming now, but like, um, yeah, TD is like the go-to person to talk about streaming. Yeah, Sash. Right, so uh, um, the question is, uh, it, 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 the, it kind of sounds like uh, the, uh, the executors read data from each other until the executor dies, in which case you read it from, from uh, the shuffle service. In, in fact, if the shuffle service is enabled, which is enabled by a flag, then you always read from the shuffle service for shuffle data. Uh, if it's not, then the executors are happy to read from each other instead. Okay. So, and, and there's an initial s bootstrap when the executor starts and shuffle service is enabled, it will tell the shuffle service where its own files are located. So it can find them during the, throughout the job and afterwards. Anything else? Oh, yeah. What's the resilience score? What happens when the process running data dies? So if the process running the, the, uh, the storage service dies, I, the question is really, so first of all, Spark is fundamentally resilient to the type of failure. It will just rerun the tasks in the map side. So that, that's fine. Uh, if, however, the, re the shuffle service is restarted within, you know, the timeouts of the other machines, so if you have some sort of automatic monitoring going on, then it will automatically, can, like, retry and, and find the data again. But uh, even the worst case scenario isn't that bad. It, but it is, like, it, it's definitely suboptimal, which is why we have it. <laughs> yeah. Not currently. So, so do you mean like if it's? Sorry, can you can you? Yeah, so, right, so, so the policy that I described is actually, uh, I, call it a heurist, I call it a set of heuristics because it doesn't describe completely, um, say, like, the ideal set of, the, the ideal, um, ideal, like, policy that you can actually allocate resources. It's not like, it's not like when you remove an executor, uh, when, as soon as it finishes a task, you should remove it, and that's why there's a timeout. Um, yeah, in general, this is a very hard problem to predict when an executor is going to soon run another task. So uh, that's why we need a set of heuristics. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right, let's, let's take uh, two more questions, and then we'll let you guys like mingle. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. The, uh, uh, you know, removal and starting up of executor, that mostly addresses the CPU resource. So it actually addresses both memory and CPU? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand. In a fairly couple manner, you cannot say, take it, allocation or reallocation of memory is specifically just for one job, you know, just by itself.
So, so are you are you saying um, in the case where like an executor might have many many cores, but you know, it, like it, it's actually a very small process in terms of memory. In which case, like releasing that executor won't buy you that much in terms of memory. A large amount of memory. oh memory. Yeah, so we don't we don't handle so this thing doesn't handle like memory or cores like separately. It just treats an executor as a unit of execution. Um, so in that sense, when you have different applications with different size executors, like uh, it might have three cores and five twelve meg, or like you know ten cores and like one meg. Well, not one meg, one gig. Like these executors aren't, aren't actually really comparable. Um, so it really depends on what kind of applications run in your cluster. Um, yeah, so the allocation policy is actually not finer grained than that. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, by the way, this whole thing really depends on what your application does. Like, uh, the, the manager, so, like, the sysadmin of the cluster can't really set a setting that enables this for all applications. Like, as an application, you can still decide to, like, hold on to all resources or, or just, like, not enable this at all. So, this assumes a cooperative kind of sharing of a cluster rather than, you know, it's like one application trying to dominate everyone else. Certainly won't work for those cases. So, uh, yeah. I'm going to break uh, for now, and you guys can like c you guys are welcome to come talk to me and Aaron will be like uh, standing right here. I, I would like to say one more thing. Uh, so we have addressed several shortcomings of the current service. This is a very new service one that So I'd like to point out that if you have a use case which is like, oh, I really need this to work on Mesos, for instance, then please have your voice be heard in the community so we know what to focus on. Next, okay? Because there are several things we could focus on and we just need to prioritize. Okay. So please feel free. Yeah, and, and thanks a lot for Galvanize for hosting us. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming.